Okay, let's set things straight. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is not a bad movie. Disliking a film doesn't automatically make it bad. But Crystal Skull does have problems. Many, 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 many problems. And I'm not talking about the ones everybody mentions. This movie could have worked with Old Indiana, Aliens, Russians, Shia LaBeouf, and even... Yep. More on that later. No, the main problem, the fundamental reason why so many fans dislike this film is that Crystal Skull is not an Indiana Jones movie, but a movie with Indiana Jones. Or rather, a movie with a guy that happens to share the same name. Sure, he has the hat and the whip and it's still Harrison Ford, but we don't have to go much further than the first few lines of dialogue to realize that these two are not really the same character. Well, the way you're sinking your teeth into those wobbies, I should think maybe... Are you Indiana Jones or Sherlock Bloody Holmes? You see, Indiana Jones is a man of very few words. He only speaks when necessary and usually begrudgingly. You're insulting them and you're embarrassing me. He's straight to the point. I didn't know you could fly a plane. Why, yes. Plan? No. He's witty. Did you guys ever go to Sunday school? And he doesn't have a lot of patience. In Crystal Skull, he's the most garrulous he's ever been. Supposedly the Uga tribe were chosen by the gods 7,000 years ago to build a giant city out of geoglyphs. Solid gold. Giant ancient tribes. Carved with the desert in water. Perverse. Closed eyes, ground sleep. Provided the sun. The Indians were at the sky. Only the race got literally a night in the middle of the day. The Indians were closed together. Covered by projects. The Indians were one of the pieces of wreckage. After all those years, we spent spying on the Reds. By the way, a little side note here. Am I the only one who has a hard time imagining Indiana Jones as a double agent? The guy who never plans ahead, fails to achieve most of his own goals and cannot go anywhere in the world without being recognized by someone. Dr. Jones, the eminent archaeologist. Thank you again, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Dr. Jones, I knew it was you. This guy, a spy. Really. The movie paints him as this great hero that has dedicated all his life serving his country. Do you have any idea how many medals this son of a bitch won? But he's just a college professor that likes to go on expeditions for the thrill of the adventure. Indiana Jones never came across as a man with strong political convictions, much less as someone who would dedicate years of his life spying on the Russians. He hates Nazis, sure, but that's because they were trying to kill him all the time. Those people are trying to kill us! I know, Dad! But I digress. There are a few instances sprinkled throughout the film where Indy acts as his old self. But more often than not, he seems to be missing an off switch. Thinking, Quick but I'm calm. It's a mix of sand, mud, and water, and depending on the viscosity. Indy is a knowledgeable guy, but he's not constantly lecturing all the facts he knows. When it comes to scorpions, the bigger the better. The small one bites you. Don't keep it to yourself. Wow, Professor. That's a very interesting fact, I guess. The main reason he talks so much in this movie is that he's the biggest vehicle to convey exposition to the audience. Since the majority of the supporting characters don't know what's going on, he's the only one who can explain things. The previous three movies also have their fair share of exposition, but when it comes to explaining the plot or the MacGuffin, Indy is usually accompanied by people who know as much as he does. This allows the information to be balanced out with other characters and not just Indy making these scenes feel more like actual conversations rather than lectures. Speaking of supporting characters... Although we think of Indiana Jones films as films with, well, the character of Indiana Jones, there are surprisingly very few scenes in the franchise where our protagonist is all by himself. He's always joined by side characters with whom he can play off of, contrasting characters that work as foils and make Indy's traits stand out. One of the reasons we like Indy is because we also like the way he interacts with his supporting cast. We enjoy their distinct personalities, how their differences and similarities play off of each other, how sometimes they mirror one another and butt heads. 
I told you! Don't call me Junior. Even though Indy is the titular character and the leading man, he depends a whole lot on the strength of the sporting characters. And there's no place more evident of this than Crystal Skull. The characters in Crystal Skull aren't necessarily bad. However, they're not as memorable because the movie favors plot details and big reveals over character development, even though there's clearly the intent of creating interesting character dynamics. People poo-poo Mutt Williams a lot, but he's actually the most interesting new character in this movie. Mutt is a bit vain and a scrub, and he pretends to be a lot tougher than what he really is. But he has a lot of heart, and he goes to great lengths to protect the ones he loves. Mutt and Lindy have very distinct personalities. They're two men from very different generations that play off of each other really well. There's this little great moment in the cafe at the beginning where Mutt steals a bottle from the waitress and Indy puts it back. It's a fantastic subtle interaction that introduces their father-son relationship. There's plenty of room for conflict and friction and they work well as a team. But then the plot gets in the way and once they begin looking for the skull, things get less interesting. The initial friction is gone and so is most of the fun. Much like Indy devotes the majority of his dialogue explaining things, so does Mott, whose lines consist mostly of plot-related questions. What are we looking for? Why would Ox want to take the school there? Return where? Why is it like that? What happened to him? What's the power? Who is that? What's that? What was it? What is it? What are those? And when Indy provides the answers, we never get to know what Mutt thinks or feels about all of this. We can only assume that he finds it interesting since he's listening and asking questions. There's nothing inherently wrong in having characters with very plot-driven dialogue, but it's important to take the opportunity to reveal character traits and beliefs. The Ark. If it is there, Tannis, then it is something that man was not meant to disturb. My grandpa was a magician. He spent his entire life with a rabbit in his pocket and pigeons up his sleeves. He made a lot of children happy and died a very poor man. Magic rocks, fortune and glory. It doesn't always have to be a long monologue. Sometimes a brief glimpse of personality will do the trick. Inside him welling up for eternal life. <laughs> the Indian mud dynamic doesn't live up to its full potential because their dialogue is very focused on exposition. This extensive exposit of plot information comes at the cost of playful character dynamics and the audience never gets to spend enough time with the character's actual personality in order to grow and get fond of them. This same problem repeats with the rest of the supporting characters. The movie establishes conflict between the characters but then completely forgets about it in order to move along with the plot. Marion is mad at Indy for abandoning her at the altar 20 years ago, but the conflict is introduced and immediately resolved. Indy and Maud clash because they just found out their father and son, except when it's convenient to have them work together without much of a fight. Mac and Indy should be at odds because Mac betrayed him, yet Indy lets Mac tag along without ever suspecting him or asking any questions. Despite all their differences, they all get along surprisingly well. None of these conflicts change their behavior with one another, nor do they affect the plot in any significant way. There's no bickering, no banter, no funny exchanges, no character development. They're essentially just walking side by side from plot point to plot point. Even the villain seems to get along well with our hero. They share long scenes together chit-chatting over tea and cookies before there's any sense of danger for the protagonist. In the other films, it takes no longer than a few minutes, sometimes seconds, for the bad guys to try to kill Indy. The poison you just drank <laughs> up with In Crystal Skull, it's all about finding the thing that leads to the next new thing and less about fun character interactions and playfulness. This, in turn, makes the characters feel like mere devices for plot points and plot twists rather than real people. Marion's biggest purpose in the whole film is to reveal that Mutt is Indy's son. Mac is only there at the end so he can do his double-double crossing twist and bring the villains to the MacGuffin. And Professor Oxley is essentially the inciting incident that kicks the whole plot in motion. Oxley in particular is a very frustrating case, not only because the late great John Hurt had very little to do in this film, but also because there's this great relationship between Oxley and Mutt that's never truly explored. 
from the very brief moments they share together, it's clear they have a really strong bond. Oxley is a stronger father figure to Mutt than Indy will probably ever be. Oxley is Mutt's driving force, and it breaks Mutt's heart to see the man who raised him completely lose his mind. There's a lot of emotional potential to dwell into, but unfortunately, not a lot of screen time is dedicated to their relationship. Their lifelong surrogate father-son connection is essentially ignored and has no impact on Indy and Mutt's relationship. Indy never comes to the realization that he, the biological father, had less of an active presence in his son's life than Oxley. Marion never addresses Oxley as a close family friend, and we never get to see Mutt's reaction after Oxley is back to normal. The possible conflicts and relationships weren't explored, leaving us with, yet again, another missed opportunity. So many missed opportunities. Missed opportunity with Oxley and Mutt, with Marion and Indy, with Indy and Mutt... And then there's Mac. <sighs> Even though the movie makes a lot of effort in telling us that these two lived great adventures together... Well, we'd been through worse. Yeah, when? Flensburg, there was twice as many. We were younger. All of it comes across as disingenuous, because that's not what we see on the screen. Despite knowing each other for several years, Mac and Indy act more like acquaintances than associates. There's nothing in the way they interact that shows us they are great friends. Indy seems to see Mac more as a co-worker he's forced to put up with, rather than a friend, which in and of itself could be a great source of conflict. Yet the movie insists this is a genuine friendship. I thought we were friends, Mac. This is nothing like Indy's relationship with Marcus Brody, Sala, or Short Round, where we can tell from subtle interactions and body language that there's a rich history between the characters and a strong friendship prior to the movie. When Mac dies, we're supposed to see it as a tragic death. I'm gonna be alright. You know, like a tragic antagonist who couldn't change his ways, ultimately leading himself to his own demise. But that never comes across, and huge part has to do with Mac and Indy's undeveloped relationship. The movie doesn't dedicate enough time to this character dynamic for there to be an emotional bond, both for Indy and for the audience. The closest they ever get to a bonding moment is when Indy punches Mac in the face. Mac doesn't have any redeeming qualities. He's introduced as a traitor, selfish and greedy, and never really changes. Even at the very end, when the temple is disintegrating, he chickens out and doesn't help anyone, only to steal more gold. He is not the type of guy who particularly inspires a lot of sympathy from the audience to deserve a tragic death. I feel a lot more sympathy for Belloc than I do Mac, and Belloc has a maniacal laughter. <laughs> Relationships have always been at the very core of these movies. In Raiders, it's all about Marion and Indy resolving their troubled past, and Indy reaching the realization that there's maybe more to life than finding the thing. In The Last Crusade, it's the relationship between Indy and his father, where this time around it's Henry Jones Sr. who realizes that there's more to life than his personal obsession with the thing. What did you find, Dad? Illumination. And in Temple of Doom, okay, there's this general consensus amongst fans that Willie Scott is useless and annoying, but she is intentionally useless and annoying. She's the polar opposite of Indy. Willie finds Indy a brood, Indy finds Willie insufferable, and neither of them wants to admit they find the other attractive. See? Conflict. Their personalities clash and there's a lot of chemistry and sexual tension, but not romance. The real relationship of this movie is between Indy and Short Round. Indy, I love you! As in a father-son, mentor-student relationship, let's not get too creepy here. Although Willie spends the majority of the film screaming and being rescued, she saves Indy and Short Round at the end, with, in my opinion, the best kill of the entire film. Ah! 
Willie gets more fierce as the story progresses. She's still whiny and never becomes a quote unquote badass, but she has a little arc, which is a lot more than any of these supporting characters get to have. In Crystal Skull, there's only one character that gets all the attention, and that's the Skull. I think it's safe to say that the majority of the fans find the Skull to be lame. I can't really argue against that. In all fairness, an object that not a lot of people have heard about and has been proven to be a fake doesn't have the same appeal, pomp and circumstance as a legendary artifact that has never been found, that's surrounded by mystery and has captivated people's imagination for centuries. But although the Crystal Skull doesn't have the riches of real-life mythologies, that isn't a reason why it doesn't work as a MacGuffin. There's actually nothing fundamentally wrong with the MacGuffin itself. The problem, however, is in the character's interest and reasoning for going after the MacGuffin. In all three movies, Indiana Jones has a clear motivation to chase the MacGuffin. In Raiders, he wants the Ark because it's an artifact of great significance. That thing represents everything we got into archaeology for in the first place. In Temple of Doom, he wants the stones because he's looking for... Fortune and glory. And in The Last Crusade, he wants the Grail to save his father's life. I didn't come for the cup of Christ. I came to find my father. Simple and straightforward motivations that let the audience understand why the protagonist is part of this story. So, why is Indy after the Crystal Skull? Quick answer? We never really get to know why. The Crystal Skull plotline is introduced by Mott, who isn't so much interested in finding the skull, but rather follow the trail that could lead to his mother's and Professor Oxley's whereabouts. Mott asks for Indy's help. However, Indy doesn't show much of an interest in the artifact. Interesting craftsmanship, but that's about it. He doesn't have a close relationship with Oxley. I haven't talked to Harold Oxley in 20 years. Nor does he know at this point that Mutt's mother is Marion. Mary? Mary Williams, you remember her? We're a lot of Marys, kid. He has no recreational interest in finding the skull, nor does he have any personal stakes involved. Yet, after the conversation is interrupted by the best sequence of the film, Indy just begins looking for the skull without having a compelling enough reason to do so. It's not clear why he wants to find the artifact. It seems like he's just going along because he has nothing better to do. This lack of motivation is really evident. The movie struggles to find reasons to justify the fact that Indy is looking for the MacGuffin. In the first stage, Indy is after the skull to get to Oxley. After they find the skull, Oxley and Marion, Indy continues looking for the city of Akator because the Russians threaten to kill Marion if he doesn't do so. And after they get away from the Russians, Indy still wants to return the skull to the city's temple because he has been brainwashed by the skull itself. I have to return it. Why you? Because it told me to. None of these reasons are played strongly enough for the audience to be invested in the protagonist's quest for the MacGuffin, which might explain why so many people find the artifact bland and uninteresting. Indy doesn't show much of an interest in the thing, so neither does the audience. In the previous installments, the scenes where Indy finds the artifacts are incredibly cinematic. The light changes, the music swells, the characters' faces light up, all done with very little dialogue that allows the scene to breathe and take its time. Everything's dazzling and fantastical, giving the artifacts otherworldly qualities that enhance their mysticism. In Crystal Skull, they... they just find it. The scene plays out like any other scene from the movie. There's no spectacle surrounding it, which makes the skull feel normal and mundane as any other everyday object. There's also no ticking clock. In the other pictures, there's always tension present in these scenes. The heroes are close to a new clue or the artifact itself, and we intercut with the bad guys looming, getting closer and closer. Tension builds, there's suspense, there's a ticking clock. Will the heroes escape before the bad guys arrive? Here the bad guys show up at the end of the scene, but there's no tension, no suspense, because we had no idea that the bad guys were even close to begin with. 
All of these reasons contribute to a not very engaging MacGuffin, but the worst offender is really the lack of motivation. Not just from Mindy, but from pretty much every other character. In the first act, Matt has a strong motivation to be after the MacGuffin. The lives of his loved ones depend on how successful he is at finding the skull. Now, Ox said he hid that skull someplace, and if my mom doesn't come up with it, they're gonna kill them both. These are great personal stakes that drive the character through the plot, but once they find Oxley and Marion, Matt has no longer any reason to be chasing the MacGuffin. Yet he continues to do so. Through eyes and tears, we gotta go through that waterfall! I'll do it, nobody else has to come. Who cares? Well, you did just two seconds ago. We gotta go through that waterfall! Oh, the motivations of these characters are so confusing. Even though Indy states that he must go by himself, they all follow him anyway. Why? Why is anyone here? None of these characters are interested in the skull. Matt only wants to save Oxley and Marion, Marion wants to rescue Oxley, Oxley is cuckoo crazy, and Mac is only looking for money regardless where he comes from. Go. Oh, me. If it was established earlier that returning the skull would bring Oxley back to normal, then it would have made more sense to have Marion, Oxley and Matt around. But the characters and the audience have no idea that's even a possibility up until the very end. Interdimensional beings in point of fact. Welcome back, Ox. Instead, they're returning the skull because... Because it told me to. This feels a bit forced and contrived and it strips the character from its own agency. But hey, at least there's a motivation. I think. The only character with a clear motivation to be chasing the skull is the villain, Irina Spalko. She wants the skull for its mind-reading powers, because with them, she can turn people to the Russian side and take over the world. A mind weapon. A new frontier of psychic warfare. That was Stalin's dream. Clear and straight to the point motivation. You go, girl. Go get that skull. By the third act of Crystal Skull, we have too many characters with very little to do and no reason to be here. It's not surprising if the audience isn't invested by this point. The characters gain nothing or lose nothing by returning the skull. There are no stakes involved, no clear rewards or consequences. The characters are just following the motions that the plot dictates. As incredible and appealing a MacGuffin may be, if the characters don't show any interest in it, neither will the audience.